Welcome to the Grief Dreams Podcast, where we have conversations with guests about their life, loss, grief, and of course, grief dreams, which can be dreams of the deceased. If you want to know more about the topic and your host, please visit the website, griefdreams.ca. To support the podcast, please go ahead and rate it. For additional ways to support the show, please see the episode show notes. Before I move on with the show, I would like to give a territory acknowledgement. Long before Canada was formed, the Stalo people were the original land stewards, and they have lived here since time immemorial. They continue to live in the unceded Stalo territory known to settlers as the Fraser Valley and Lower Fraser Canyon of British Columbia. I recognize and honor the contribution that Indigenous peoples have made and continue to make to our community and the topic of grief dreams. Welcome to the Grief Dreams Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in again. I'll be your host, Joshua. And today we have on the podcast, Dr. Enrique Mundaka, who is a university lecturer in ecology. And I've had the pleasure of talking with him a few times. And it's such, I'm so excited for you to be on the show with us to give the listeners a new perspective on some of the dreams that you're having and what dreams actually are existing. Because you came from a certain perspective, which I really found fascinating, um, was that you didn't believe in an afterlife. You know, yeah. One would say what you'd be, is an atheist or agnostic? Yes, atheist, atheist. Atheist, a- atheist. And now you've changed your perspective because of these dreams you've had of your deceased friend. So I want to get yes. into all of that and just welcome you to the show. <laughs> Hello, Josh. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here today um, from a, such a far far away place such as Chile, you know, uh, this is a Canada-Chile communication, which is a kind, kind of a long distance. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be with you. I, you know, at the beginning, I didn't want to share this with anybody else, but then with the passing of months, you know, I, I changed my perspectives and my ideas and, and I wanted to share this experience. And, and one of the reasons, actually the reason why I really decided to share this was because I thought that it could help some people that are going through difficult moments, you know, like grieving times, and probably listening to these kind of experiences would give them, I don't know, hope, or probably just a little bit of peace of mind, you know. So that's why I decided to do it, and and I'm really really happy that you you gave me this opportunity. And that's beautiful, and that's what we hope from the podcast. It can provide. <laughs> listeners with a different perspective <clears throat> to help them on their journey through grief. Yes. And so I want to first, I guess, ask you about the journey to being, I guess, being an atheist. Was it something that like you've tried, uh, like, did people try to challenge you throughout life and it just it always <laughs> stuck? Okay. Well, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I was born in a Catholic family and here in South America, you know, Catholicism is some something prevalent. Uh, most of people are Catholics. Either if they are very committed or not, everybody would declare themselves Catholics. Uh, that has been changing a little bit during the last years, 10, 10 years maybe. Now, people that declare themselves themselves as atheists or um, agnostics are more common. Uh, but in those days, I'm, I'm 49 years old, so I was born in 1974. Uh, so I grew up in a Catholic country, basically. I went to a Catholic high school, and I was quite committed to Catholicism, actually, in, even in my teenaging, my teenager days. And, and it's interesting because I'm quite grateful for that. And the main reason for to be grateful is that the amount of values that I got from from religion, you know, were were quite important for me in my you know, as as a person, I got all these values, particularly solidarity, you know, taking care of others and things like that. I always doubted all the religious part, you know, faith, resurrection, that kind of thing. I did never, never really, I wasn't convinced. If you add to that, that I was, I just, I wanted to be a biologist since I was like two years old, because I was quite fond of insects and plants and animals in general. And I always wanted to be a biologist. So of course, what happened, I I went to university, I was 18 years old. And of course, that was like a consolidation, you know, like, okay, now I understand more evolution, you know, uh, zoology, ecology, et cetera, et cetera. I really don't think there is anything else. And that's how I, I became an atheist. The good thing is that I am—I was kind of a peaceful atheist, you know. 
I mean, I wasn't disrespecting people that had faith in something, and that's very important because atheists in general are seen as very aggressive people that don't believe, you know, and they don't like others to believe. Of course, I would challenge some of some very particular things in religion and I don't know, guiltness, for example, feeling guilt about something. I don't like that kind of stuff. But I could, you know, live together with people that are have faith and, and that's all right. So that's my journey. I became an atheist just basically because of the my reasoning and the study of science, a bit of philosophy here and there. So that's why it wasn't a traumatic process. There was nothing like traumatic involved. It was just like a conclusion, you know, like you keep studying. I even went into my times as a Buddhist. Okay. I explored Buddhism. I read all the things that, you know, like of our witnesses and I had a friend from a Mormon friend from Utah so I read the books there very interesting in terms of historical things yeah so I kind of explore things and Islam as well I have friends from you know from that religion and from all of them I can take very interesting values and stuff but I decided to remain an atheist so that's basically my journey into that way of thinking you know that's interesting I, I hear that a lot about academia how like, mm. it, yeah, when people get into academia, um, they start yeah. thinking a little differently and they can like become more atheistic in that way. And so you've had a, a loss. And so it's really interesting to sort of see that perspective, like as someone's going through their grief, yeah. because um, a lot of people do <clears throat> utilize um, their religion or spirituality as a way of coping and yes. understanding, right, a little bit differently about what the loss is. And just a separation rather than an infinite like ending. And and so I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about your friend who's, who's died and then what that journey was like for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, my friend, we, we, (laughs) I'm thinking about him. Well, I think about him every day. We were very close friends. We met in 1984. We got to the same school. Uh, So we went into the same class. We were both new kids, you know, we didn't become friends immediately we were just classmates you know but every time we i would approach him we we had like a good vibe you know like hey always all right i had some other friends and then we started to meet each other you know and when we were around 12 i would say that we got really you know very we got very close he was an amazing person a mathematician uh, a total geek i was a, a biology geek he was a mathematics and physics geek of course, I was always getting really low grades in my mathematics, but it wasn't because I couldn't I couldn't deal with it. It was just because I I didn't understand. I was interested, but because of him, he he taught me lots of things. When we were actually 12, 13, he was an amazing character, unique person. It was the only person I always say it was the only person in the world that totally understood understood me. Yeah, and it was the same for him in terms of. I would understand him as well, very well. So it was inevitable to to become good friends. And and more than friends, we became like brothers, you know. So we knew everything about each other. Uh, I can, I'm blessed with a good memory. <laughs> so I can remember details from 20 or 30 years ago. Actually, I've got a record. I can remember, I have some, some memories when I was five months old that I can describe situations and my parents would be absolutely, you know, like... <laughs> Like it was done. So, um, so I was, we became really good friends. We basically, we grew up together, you know, uh, we knew everything about, you know, the first girlfriend that he had, the first girlfriend that I had. So we, we shared everything or, we're, and recalling lots of our stories, actually, there was something that I, <laughs> I just managed to remember a few, few months ago, actually, after we, we had our first conversation. And I remember that we had with my friend a conversation about what would happen if you die, if any of us die first. We were in high school, 17 years old, around that age. And of course, it was nothing too deep. It was just always, you know, half a joke. And and, and then we agreed on something. We we said, okay, if you die first, at the follow at the next day, I would go. You you have to come to my living room, and I'll wait for you there at three three thirty. So you have to give me a sign that you're around. And he said, okay, if that happens to you, we'll do the same. And that kind of, I, I had forgotten about that. And then he came back a couple of months ago and I was like, oh my gosh, we had an agreement. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? We had an agreement. So so now if I think, you know, a bit back in what happened to me in, in, in January and February of this year, I would say like, okay, he was fulfilling an agreement. He came back to see me. Not exactly the same way that we had agreed with. Uh, okay, well, but so that, that was the way how we became good friends. And then we... We finished high school, we went to university, same university, different faculties. He went to engineering school, I went to biology. We were always together, always do things. Then he got quite engaged with his girlfriend, who in time became his wife. Uh, so I didn't see him very often. But, then, you know, we had this relationship, this friendship that is basically, you can be without seeing each other for two years and then you see that person and it's exactly like yesterday no, no, it's like, so yeah that's how we became good friends and even though i lived in i lived in new zealand and you know, i lived overseas for many years we were always in touch and and I, one of the things that i i'm really thankful is that he was always very supportive okay i always remember in 2000 my first three weeks in new zealand were kind of rough my english was horrible i was feeling alone first time being so you know, far away from home um, and he would be the person sending me messages, you know, by computer. I know there were no cell phones those days, but I would find it. Come on, keep on going. Tell me how it, how it was. Uh, I remember there was a blonde girl at the library, and every time I would go there, I would say, "Hey, the blonde one is here. Ah, oh, tell me how she is and stuff." You know, right? So I, I do remember. I do remember a lot of that, and I, I'm and I'm very very thankful. You know, like he was an amazing person. Like his support, I, I miss him very much now. Even now, as adults with kids, you know, both of us, you know, sometimes I will have a problem in my job, you know, and I will send him an email, like, hey, you know, I had a, an argument with this person and he will be like, okay, tell me about it. I should do this. Did you try this? Okay. Let's... And it will be the, the other way around as well. He would say, hey, do you remember this guy? Yeah, I had a fight with him. What happened? And I'm... So, so, yeah, it was, I mean, we had a life together. You know, um, and that is not happening anymore. So even though I, it has been almost 11 months since his passing, I'm still, I cannot believe it. Um, and that's a feeling that comes to me from time to time, very often actually, that I cannot believe it. And, and I find myself, you know, grabbing my cell phone, ready to send an, a message or just thinking, hey, I saw this picture, I should... Um that has been difficult. Okay. It has been difficult. Yeah. Well, it seems that he was one of those people that you would lean on for support. And like yes. now you're needing support and he's not there. Right. Like because the whole thing, and that's such a difficult aspect that I think people forget when it comes to the grieving process is when you're hmm. grieving the person that provide you that support. You know, like there's certain people or even animals that can give you that. And when that's gone, it's, it makes it even tougher because you feel even more alone through the process. And so when it comes to the initial reactions of his passing, how did you, how did you work with that? How did you, um, I guess, deal with that before the dreams? Because I know the dreams are coming and they're, yes, yes. <laughs> they're pretty uh, amazing, amazing dreams. But before yes. that, in between the dreams and just like his death. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would divide that process like into two main events. The first one was in 2011, um, when I came back from New Zealand to Chile. I came back to live in Chile, actually. I think it was in August that he, he mm. rang me and he said, you know, Enrique, I, I have cancer. And I couldn't believe it. I, I was stunned. I, I was just absolutely, you know, <laughs> paralyzed. Because you can imagine that was 2011, we were still young, you know, 30-something. And I couldn't believe it. And I was... I was sitting here, you know, and I was like, hey, but how can you say that? And I remember I asked him to send me all his, you know, like exams and everything. And I jumped into journals and I discovered his type of cancer. And then I kind of, I read like, I was reading for like two weeks and I went to see him because we lived in different cities. And I said, okay, you have this type of cancer. It's in, in between. It's not that aggressive. So you... There are good options. So he was quite surprised and he, he said, well, he thanked me a lot. And he said, okay, can you give me all that information? I'll take it to the doctor. Uh, it was quite surprising to know that the doctor didn't know all these things. <laughs> but of course, you know, biologists, we are kind of geeky. <laughs> 
so that was the first thing. And from that moment onwards, I would say, life changed a little bit because he w- he didn't have any symptoms. But then he went through a really huge surgery because he had to get, you know, removed, all these things removed. So that changed his life. He was in a really bad stage. I saw him suffering a lot. And, and that was horrible for me. It was like I had nightmares, you know, like I didn't... I didn't know what to do. How can I, you know, like take this burden off my friend's shoulders? But there was, of course, nothing I could do. So I went to see him. He had an operation in Santiago, which is the capital, you know, where all the more advanced things are. So he was in a really bad condition for around two years. And then he recovered. And his cancer was really strange because it was very slow. So from 2013 until 2018, he lived a pretty normal life. Uh, So we would visit each other, you know, have the same. Even at some stage, I kind of forgot that he had cancer. Uh, It was, he was, you know, just living normally, doing crazy stuff. Like he was always a very crazy person. And I think I told you that he was always pushing, you know, the boundaries of things. And in good ways and times, and sometimes in ways that I wouldn't have done. (laughs) But but I was, (laughs) but he was always telling me all his crazy things, you know, all the crazy things he did. Um, and for me, it was just a source of amusement and friendship. You know, I never judged him. We knew each other so well that I knew exactly what he was feeling when he was doing things. He was a mischievous little kid, you know. So <laughs> so for those years, we had a really, really normal life. We would, you know, call each other. I would see each other. Of course, we didn't have a lot of time because we, we had families and jobs and we lived in different cities and it's like 300 kilometers away, you know, it still takes a, quite a while to, to get there. To, but, but okay, it was, it was all right. But then you know what happened? The pandemia, the COVID pandemic, it came. And, and that was horrible because we missed 2020. That was his last year being born, you know, in a normal way because then he started deteriorating and he got very sick. By the end of 2020, he was already quite sick and I couldn't visit him. Um, something interesting, he was extremely sick. He, he, the cancer had spread everywhere and he got COVID twice with minimum symptoms and nobody could believe that. He was in a really bad health, you know, state in general, but <laughs> the COVID didn't do anything to him. Actually, when I got COVID, I was far sicker than him, which was, yeah, surprising. Although he was a, an athletic person, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't use any drugs, you know. Um, I think that in my life, I saw him drunk, drunk once, <laughs> which is uh, being friends. And, and, and it was quite interesting. Every time we would get together, we would go and have a cake uh, and, and drink Coke. <laughs> And that's really weird because with all my other friends, I go for a beer. But in our case, we kept doing the things that we did when we were 12, 13, you know. And that was spontaneous. Like, I I don't know. I would say, hey, I'll I'll stop by your house, you know. And he would be waiting for me with his favorite, our favorite, um, nut kuchen. You know kuchen? Uh, It's a cake. Uh, It's a pie. I said, walnut walnut pie. Kuchen is the German name that we use here in Chile for and and drinking Coke. He was fanatic of Coke. That was his, his thing. I used to. Now I changed into some other brand that I shouldn't say. <laughs> yeah. I, should, I, I forgot that this is online. It's going to be online. So I shouldn't say the names. <laughs> okay. So so that would be the way how we, we lived our lifetime. And then, of course, when he got extremely sick in 2020, even though I couldn't visit him, I started Stunning a little bit of the journey of what, basically, if you can summarize this, what's going to happen to your friend in this last stage? So I I needed to understand that in order to be able to support him. He was far more Catholic than me. He he believed. He had interviews with uh, priests, you know. And I was, you know, just reading. And and there there is a very interesting author, a researcher, actually, Dr. Peter Fennick from, from the UK. He specializes in near death, near death experiences, but he also has some research in, you know, what happens exactly before people die. So we had these conversations a couple of times online. Then in 2021, I was able to go and visit him. Not too many times as I, I would have wanted. And then in 2022, last year, of course, then I, I had the opportunity to go. I would 
you know, just go and visit him for a day, you know, catch the bus in the, mo- in the morning here, stay with him, come back at night. And then we had lots of conversations. So that would be for me the second part of the of the journey, you know, the last when he was very sick and we managed to be more together. Um, I would send him an, a message every single day and um, WhatsApp, you know, um, like I'm with you. Uh, that's my hand. I'm hugging you. He wouldn't reply because he was too weak, of course. And But I would say, you know, like, doesn't matter. I know you saw it. That's enough for me, you know. So in that regard, I would say I was very lucky. Okay. We, we had our conversations before. Yes. Before he parted. Yes. And that's so beautiful that you're able to have those conversations with him mm. and to be able to be uh, such a strong support in his life as he's going through such a difficult yeah. journey. Mm. Yeah, it was, I I would say that is, that's the lucky part, you know. Sometimes I think about people that die in accidents and they don't have the opportunity to say goodbye to those that they love. Um, in this case, it was the contrary. I think even though he, he went through hell because it was really hell, the last stage he was terrible. Um, but there was something interesting. He didn't want to die. And even though we didn't, we, we talk about death, but but from an external point of view, you know, like what happens when you die, but not because he was going to die. And that was very interesting as well, because by August last year, and I would say a little bit before that, yeah, July last year, he was in the last stages. At, at any moment he could go, you know, he was lying in bed all day, with, you know, medications and morphine and stuff like that. But he wasn't, he refused to die. And, and, and one day I got a telephone call from his wife, I think was his wife yeah and she said Enrique now he has accepted this so now you have to come and say goodbye and I say okay that was terrible again <laughs> yeah, because I was you know visiting uh, during the previous months but th- that visit in, in in August I went there basically to say goodbye like openly uh, now he said okay I don't have a lot of time left and I said okay so we we spent like two hours talking thanking each other for what we have done in our lives you know just hugging, holding hands. He couldn't speak that much, but that was a, a terrible experience from an emotional point of view because it was painful. But then at the same time, it was beautiful because you had the opportunity to to express everything. And imagine with my good memory, I would bring back memories from you know 1985, and I would say, "You remember when we did this and you did this?" Well, I was thinking that, and I was like, "Ah, oh, that's amazing!" You know. So we had that opportunity. We we. We say goodbye to each other. And he didn't, and he uh, he stayed alive for a few more months. And I went to visit him back. But we never say anything else about it. We we, we did it. We, we say goodbye to each other. Now I go there, I stay with you. We laugh, you know, I'll bring stupid memes to, for him to have a look at, you know. <laughs> uh, I was sometimes, when I was visiting, he was so weak that he couldn't even talk. He couldn't even talk. So was funny because he was lying in his bed. It's a huge bed, a king size, I was, I, I think, yeah. So I would go there and his wife was waiting for me and I was like, okay, excuse me. And I, you know, I was removing my shoes and jumping into bed and just lying by his side, you know, like, hey, how are you? And he was like, I cannot talk. Doesn't matter. I just come here and I'll be like grabbing him, you know, like, yeah, let's stay together. And and one of those trips, I think we couldn't even we didn't even talk. I was lying there for a couple of hours. I think I actually fell asleep or something. <laughs> but it's just a company. And some things you learn from these experiences is that sometimes words are not necessary, you know. And this kind of close relationships with people, you just just being there is very important. And I know he was thankful. I know he was grateful as well. Because I could see it in his eyes. He was like, like you know, like moving his head, saying like, okay, thanks. And I think that sometimes, you know, it's not necessary to do too many things. Just being there, you know, sharing time. Yeah, that's important. And that's one of the lessons, actually, for me. Uh, and it has to do, I don't know, uh, lots of these things that I probably will say sound like cliches, you know. Like, it's important to be there for people, etc. But when you do it and when you experience it, you realize that it's quite important, you know, and it, it's, that is for real. It's not a cliche. It is good I to be the, with people. Yeah, I think the cliches are 
are good, but if you don't understand them, yes. you don't understand them, right? There's a like you can logically or intellectually understand it, but it's actually mm-hmm. like feeling it and knowing it and your being what it's actually representing. And I think that's what you got. You you knew in those moments what those words meant or what yes. these words are meaning now. Yes. Yes. So yeah, that's what happened until he passed away. I wasn't with him. That was a little bit painful for me, although I knew that probably I was not going to be with him because I lived, you know, in a different place. But on the other hand, what what, what happened as well? I had, I have had this conversation with um, his wife, and I told her it is possible that he will see somebody a few days before he dies. He will see somebody like a like a shade, you know, in in the room, and that happens. It's been you know, document, documented. And probably he will talk to people that passed, you know, like family members that have already passed and passed away. And and all that happened, but I wasn't there. So when I talked to, to his wife, his wife said, you know, Enrique, he's been seeing this person, dark person sitting in the corner. And he's like, yeah, he's right there. Or that person, I don't know, he or she was just there. And you know that in mythology, that's called the, Death angel, but it's been recorded everywhere, and, and people in hospices, for example, where they're very ill or old, pe- or old people, you know, they see the same. And then his wife also told me, Enrique, he started calling his calling his grandmother, uh, like ten or twenty minutes before he died. He just looked staring at this, you know, at the ceiling, and I'm coming, my grandma, I'm coming, just wait for me. And he was very happy. And I told her that I was going to pass as well. It was it's going to happen. So in that regard, I said, oh, I think, yeah, that I, I gave her, like his wife, a little bit of comfort, you know, like knowing that what was going to happen as well. But still, of course, it, the passing of a beloved person is, is quite traumatic for everybody. Okay. So on the other hand, I wasn't there and probably <laughs> it would have been even worse for me if I, have I would have been there, you know. You know what I mean? It's, it can be complicated. So yeah, that was the the last part before he passed on the fourth of January. Yeah. I remember that day like today, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, and it couldn't have been easy. Like the moment no. you got that news on yeah. the reality of which you knew was coming, right? But yes. When the moment it hits, it's like one of those things you just can't there's no words or preparation I think you can do to really understand what that moment will bring. Yeah, that was something interesting as well, because I understood that like, I wasn't prepared, that you cannot be prepared even if you know that, what's going to happen. You can make up your mind, you can just think about it, you know, you can actually plan, you know, okay, I'm going to do this and this. It doesn't work. I was devastated. It was terrible. I think I told you in our previous conversation, I have never experienced such a pain. Even though I I experienced the passing of my, my grandmother, my grandfather, you know, some uncles and aunts, this thing was a different level, was at a different level, absolutely over the, you know, the top. Um, I, I remember that day I was here at the office, actually. I was in an interview <laughs> with a newspaper. Because we we had another friend, there were three of us, and the other friend, uh, he's a very famous comedian here in Chile right now. That's like a top comedian in the country. And so I was in an interview with a journalist from Santiago, and and I just got this popping up message from uh, from from WhatsApp in my computer telling me, hey, you know, he's gone. Our friend is gone. It was from another friend of ours, and I I had to stop the the interview. And the first reaction for me was, okay, I couldn't believe it. That was the first thing. But then I felt sick. And I think I told you this before. I was physically sick. It was summer here, very hot summer here in where I am at the moment in central Chile. So I went outside and I called my wife and I said, you know, this happened. And she was like, okay, how are you doing? You know, in, in the bottom of my mind, I thought I should be crying. You know, I should be like, aloud. They're like, no. But I'm not. I'm just sitting here, nauseous. And I had this really, really strange pain, sharp pain in my chest. And well, we, when I have been, when I told these things to other friends, they said, well, that's where this broken heart thing comes from. And I never understood that, you know, that, okay, now I know. When they, you know, you 
your heart got, your heart was, was broken because of the pain. But that existed. I was feeling it and I couldn't drive. So my wife was like, okay, just wait there for an hour or so. Calm down, come home. Then we will see what we do. Of course, we will have to go to Concepcion to the south. And yeah, so I was absolutely devastated. I, I went back home, but I was kind of quiet and in pain. I was nauseous, dizzy. Then we have a, a WhatsApp group with um, members of our high school class. So I told them because there were many, you know, friends there, not, not that close, but they, they, I, I considered myself that it was important to let them know. So we started, you know, chatting and that kept me a little bit distracted um, until I really cried in the night when I it was like the kids went back to bed and I was sitting there and then I, I kind of, I got it, you know, like, oh, it wasn't too too much, you know, like, I don't know, I, something new that I realized that in Chile, people don't cry that much, okay? We have this, because I know that it's quite stereotypical that Latin American people are kind of outspoken and, you know, and they hug, and, but Chile is like an island in South America. So my wife, who is Argentinian, she was quite surprised. She was like, hey, why are you, nobody's expressing anything? Like in Argentina, they will be crying like Italians, you know, <laughs> out loud, like, ah, oh, you know. But it's cultural. It's cultural. So we kind of keep our things to ourselves in, in, in Chile. And even during the funeral, you wouldn't see the, you know, the the widow wasn't crying. She was perfectly composed. Even the mother, you know, was like crying just a little bit. So it was something interesting because now I was observing some few things, you know, that. But the problem, you know what it is? It, it doesn't help. <laughs> just being practical. But yeah, we do. We look cool, you know. Like, ah, oh, it's nice to be strong and not don't show any feelings. You, you can, you, you can handle it. But it doesn't help. I wasn't feeling any better, not at all. So when we got there the following day, we we went to the church, and he was there. The, the morning process, you know, he was there in his coffin. He was close coffin because he wasn't in a good condition. Uh, so I was sitting there, just grabbing the coffin like this, and and, and thinking. Going through our lives together, I was very sad, but I was still in pain. And that, and that during the funeral and during the day that I spent there, it became something else. I started feeling gray, blue, you know what I mean? Like the world lost colors. And I was like, I felt that I was being submerged, submerged into something like a cloud. Really strange sensation, Josh. Really, really strange. I, I never felt anything like this. I have never had depression, fortunately. But it was something really, really strange. So by the end of the process, when we went to the funeral, we left him there, you know, at the cemetery. I shared, I spent some time with his family, with my family as well. You know, my parents were there because they knew him, you know, from ooh, 30 years ago, <laughs> from the beginning of our friendship. So... Then we jumped into the car and we drove back. And the only thing that I remember was talking normally and feeling that even the highway was dark. <laughs> you know, I felt absolutely depressed. I wasn't expressing things, things anymore, nothing. I was just there. And my wife was talking to me and I was even like talking normally, like, yeah, hey, yeah, of course. She saw me quite calmed, which is good for her because she was like, okay, Enrique took it really well. But I was feeling terrible. And yeah, so we went back home. I took my little one for, a, you know, for a spin to the park. That helped a lot because we were, you know, talking and chatting. My little kid was quite impressed. He's eight years old. So he went to the funeral as well because he had to come with us. Then I noticed his change. He was grabbing me like, you're right. You know, like, basically, I don't want you to die because now he realized that dying means putting this your person that you love in a box and into you know burying that person in the ground and that's it. And my friend has a he had a has well had a, a son who is one year younger than my kid, and he he has a daughter who is one year older than my daughter. So it's basically the same. We have the same family situation. So yeah, um, I remember I stayed until late, couldn't go to bed. I was playing with my PlayStation. <laughs> I was trying to play video games to keep myself easy, and it didn't work, unfortunately. <laughs> and that's it. And that's, that's 
the where everything ends, you know, feeling I was feeling depressed, blue, dark, whatever you can call it. And then I went to bed. And that's where everything begins or began, I would say. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I uh I remember like hearing the story again. It's it's so so hard for you because you write yes. the culture saying, you know, don't show anything and you don't, mm. and then everyone around you doesn't know that you're hurting. Yes. And so they're living as if, you know, everything's okay. And they look at you as like, Oh, you're doing well. You know, like you're doing okay. They know you're sad, but they're, you're doing okay. But there's so much going on inside that they just can't see. And so it's it's such a heavy burden for anyone to just carry that alone. And so you went to bed. What happened? <laughs> well, I went to bed and I couldn't believe it again. And that happens to me even now. I can't believe it. But in that moment, I was absolutely, you know, I don't know, disturbed. I don't know. I was, yeah, I was in a bad mental condition. So I went to bed. I was really, really, really sad. And for some reason, when I was falling asleep, the only thing that I remember was saying, please come to visit me. I need to see you. But I said it many times. Like, please come to see me. I need to see you. Please come to see me. And I fell asleep. I don't know if that had anything to do with what happened afterwards. Probably did. I don't know if my brain created everything because I've been through that this thing during the last few months. And I don't think my brain is capable of such a thing. And I'll tell you now why, because now is when the dream starts. Uh, sorry, it's been kind of long, <laughs> a long introduction process, but probably it's interesting. That's, I would say that uh, that's interesting for people to hear it. So what happened? I went to bed, I fell asleep, and I remember have, I was having a dream. And, and my dream was really, really like a dream, a typical dream. I was in the middle of Santiago, the capital city of Chile. I was in a riot. There were people throwing things to each other. I don't know for what reason or anything. And I have to grab a bunch of scarves, scarves, imagine, random thing. When they were multiple colored, you know, multiple different colors. So I had to grab them and pass them to somebody. And I was in the middle of that crazy thing that uh, makes no sense, of course. When suddenly on my right, this van, this white van or capsule appears. So imagine, and everything, like I'm in the middle of the dream and everything stops. So I look at this van and there's a sliding door and there he is, my friend. But in that moment, and I can, I can tell you now, everything changed because the other dream was confusing. Was, and I couldn't remember anything more, no details. But now I remember everything because my friend, opens this door and he's like, hey, hello. And I, hey. And he said, come, come inside, come. So I jump into this van. That, it could be a capsule as well because I did, couldn't see any drivers. So I jump in there and I close the, the sliding door and I'm sitting in front of him. You know, this, some of these vehicles, they have these um, seats that face each other, you know. So I'm sitting in there and there is somebody sitting by his left, but I don't know who that person is. Like it's just a person, somebody. It's like you talking to a friend of that you see in a, on a bus, you know, you talk to a person, there is somebody else sitting there. You never look at that person. So it was the same here. And then I look at him and he's well, he's in terms of he looks very well. He's uh, same age, you know, 48, um, a bit of white hair. He's not skinny is just normal complexion he's wearing this gray how do you say a jacket with a kind of light blue ch shirt yes and gray pants so he starts talking to me like hey you know how have you been and what what's going laughing with that beautiful smile like he had all the time he's always mischievous was is the word to describe him you know like or making a little bit fun of you and uh, you know like trying to to tell you something in between, I don't know, it's, it's just a crazy guy. And he keeps on talking and uh, this van is moving and I'm like, hey, hey, just wait a minute. I interrupted the conversation. I, I haven't said anything. He said, what? what? And I tell him, this is not possible. And he says, why? Because you're sick and you cannot talk. And then he bursts on laugh, laughing, you know, laughs, just starts laughing. Hey, Enrique, what are you talking about? That's gone. I'm fine now. That's, I'm all right. Forget about it. And I'm like, really? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And actually, I want to show you something. And I'm like, 
really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, I want to show you something. And when he says this, this van, this vehicle, whatever it is, it stops. And the sliding door opens and we jump outside. And oh, this is amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the story and I'm, I'm going through again. I'm, I'm leaving it. I'm there. That's why I tell you that this is not a dream. This is not a common dream. Because I'm there now. I jump outside of this van and I see this beautiful grassland, like a pasture, you know, it's green, green, but it's like a 4K image, you know, beautiful, amazing, with, with very soft hills, you know, green hills. The, the sky is blue, it's light blue, beautiful. And in the bottom, you can see a line of trees all there in the bottom with leaves that are green and I know, golden green, you know, like starting the autumn time. There's a little bit of wind, so these leaves move. And everything is, like, there's sunshine everywhere, but I cannot see any sun. And as a good ecologist, I always have a look at the landscape. So I would say, oh, what type of tree is that? And they look like poplars, but not that with an elongated form, but more rounded. So there we are, standing you know, he was by my side and I'm looking at this beautiful thing that looks absolutely surreal. And in front of us, there's a barn, you know, a barn, a huge barn. And in between the barn and, uh, and, and us, we have like this little fence. It's a tiny wooden fence, white, which is not that high, actually. Must be less, like two feet, you know, less less than a meter. Kind of marking, you know, marking a property. Very similar to these American fences that you'd see in movies, but really low, you know. So he looked at me and he says, okay, let's go. And we cross this fence and we stand up in front of this barn and the barn is there. And now the doors are open and in the you can see the inside of the barn. If we can translate it into distances, I would say that I'm located like I'm standing like 10 meters away from the from the entrance of the barn approximately. And the barn is open. The color of this thing is like a, like bricks, brickish, you know, like this dark orange. Inside of the barn, the walls are like creamy, pale cream color painted, you know, really, really shiny. In the bottom of the barn, if you look at the two walls on the right and on the left, in the bottom, there are like windows or sliding doors full of, you know, glass. And you can see the trees, the line of trees that is behind the barn, actually, that one that I described first, you can see those trees through these windows, you know, that are located on the side. Inside of this barn, there are seven benches. There are wooden, low benches, like the ones that you find in, in churches, okay? And two are located on the left, two in the bottom, two on the right, and one is diagonal, like pointing into the entrance, you know, of the barn. While I'm looking at this, my friend disappears, and what I see next is that this barn is starting to get full of people, like lots of people entering the barn, lots of them. And I don't distinguish them very well at the beginning because I, I'm just standing there. Um, ah, and my friend told me to stay here. That was the first thing. That, so I'm standing there because he said, stay here. So I didn't venture to go, you know, forward, to move forward. So what I see now is that it's getting full of people, and some suddenly I recognize some of them. And and one is a classmate from from high school. He he's an, he's a lady right now, of course. And then the, we have another classmate of high school as well. The, then there was a partner. With my my friend had a little company that he organized at some stage, and they kind of are there, and I can identify them. They're all alive. People that are alive now, right now. And suddenly I see my dad. For some reason, my dad is alive as well, fortunately, you know. And I think I told you that he stands up a little bit there because he's very tall. Uh, he's the same age as now, like 80-something, you know, 81 years now. And he's standing there, but people don't seem to look at each other. They're just moving around inside of the barn. And suddenly I see my friend who is now with them in the middle. And he starts having, hugging them. He goes and hugs people randomly. And nobody pays attention to him. Nobody hugs back. So he will be and hug somebody, and then he moves and hugs somebody. And suddenly, my, I see my dad. My dad now is sitting. Um, and actually, if I think about it clearly, it's on the sixth, sixth, sixth bench on the 
on my right, which is the left of the barn, of course. And he's sitting there staring straight into the wall. And my friend goes and stands up, you know, by his side. He starts, you know, cuddling his hair. He hugs my dad and he looks at me while, while he's doing it. And I don't understand anything at the moment. You know, I'm just standing there without saying anything. And so my friend looks at me and he comes running from the barn to, towards me. And he looks at me like saying, so what do you think? But actually, it's just the stare, you know, like, what do you think? And I don't, un- I don't understand anything. So I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, what, what do you think? And, and then I go and I say, hey, I miss you. Yeah. And he moves forward. And, and uh, <laughs> it was really crazy. And, and he looks at me. By the way, now he's 20. He's very fit, different jacket, master colored, white t-shirt. He's younger, dark hair. And I said, hey, you know what? I miss you a lot. And, he, and I tried to lean forward, you know, to, to more move towards him. And he's like, no, 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 no. And then he says these things. Uh, I know, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Sorry, but I have too many details in my mind. He said, I said, hey, but I miss you so much. And then he comes and grabs me and, and he hugs me, you know. And that's where I can tell you, my friend, this is not, it wasn't a dream, not a typical dream. Because when he hugs me, I hug him. He, he's a few inches shorter than me. So I put my hand behind his head and I feel his skull, his hair, physically, like touching something, you know, like an object. And suddenly I start, you know, feeling, I began to feel this current, this electricity through my body. So he hugs me and I, and I'm start shaking like if, with electricity. And it gets so strong that I can picture myself from outside looking at my face, you know, with my eyes, you know, closed and feeling my teeth, you know, like when you try to lift a very heavy weight. And, and I felt that it was physical. It was unbelievable, you know, and then suddenly he, he stops hugging me and he moves backward, one step back. And I'm like, okay, what happened? And I try to move towards him again. And then he gets very serious. He says, no, no, no. And this is a translation from Spanish because the, the, the words were quite precise in Spanish. He said, no, you don't. Not here, not yet. Not yet. And I was like, but I miss you so much. Like, you're my friend. And he looks at me and he opens his jacket and grabs a handkerchief and he throws his handkerchief in front of me. So I look at the handkerchief falling, you know, to the ground and I can see some words written there. The first one is MSX, which is the brand of um, computers that we used to play when we were kids. Then it said friendship in Spanish, of course, um, with red, you know, letters. And then CSM, which is the, is the name of our group of friends of ours. You know, we, are, we are four friends that always get together and do crazy things. So, and I look at him again and I can see that this handkerchief formed like a line, like a separation line. So I try to move again and, and he pushes me very strong on my left shoulder, like, hey, no. And he gets upset. Now he changed, changes his, his, hair, his facial expression. He gets very upset and like, okay, I understand that I don't have to move. Like, really, like now I understood that. And then he changes again his face and he looks at me and starts laughing. And he says, okay, let me show you one more thing. And he turns around and grabs like a rifle, a weapon. I don't know. He looked at me and he says, he says something like, okay, can you see that? And he points towards the bottom of the barn with all these people still there. And in that bottom, in the left corner, there is like a camera. It's like a camera with a screen, like two things together. And he says, can you see that? And I say, yes, yeah, that's it. That's the past. I'm not like that anymore. That's gone. And I'm like, really? Yes, look. He points his rifle or whatever it is towards this thing and he shuts this thing and his clothes and I don't know, south in pieces. He throws his rifle away. He looks at me and he's like, okay, you know what? I really have to go now. So he turns around and he goes, like, he runs straight into the barn, but he's jumping, very unnatural jump, jumping pattern, actually. Like every, he's like running and jumping and every single 
jump like when, would be like a meter and a half from the ground, like if he were in the moon or something like that. Then he disappears on the right sliding door, the bottom of this barn. And I'm looking at this thing and then I look at the I look at the sky and I see everything dark. Then I try to look around and that's when the fall begins. Now I'm falling like a thousand meters. Like, you know, like the worst turbulence, you know, on a plane, I'm just keep falling and I try to grab something, you know, and I, I, I was quite distressed, you know, like really, literally I, I thought I was falling from, you know, from the sky. And then I woke up, I was screaming, laughing and crying. I don't know. My wife was <laughs> totally scared of this. <laughs> Are you right? And I just started saying, some, I was just saying something like, Hey, you know, I was with my friend. He came to sit, visit me. I don't know why. I, to be honest, I don't remember it very well. The only thing that I know is that I jumped out of the bed and I grabbed my cell phone and I called one of my friends who didn't pick up the phone. And then I called his wife and I told her, like, you know, I was very, <laughs> really disturbed. So I was like, I was really, really, really out of my mind. But I tried to tell her that I was with him, that he was all right. And then something really strange happened and said, he told me to call you and tell you. And his wife replies from the other side of the line, no, Enrique, I don't think he, he said that. I don't know why. But of course, when you think carefully about it, he never said that. How did she know? <laughs> I have no idea. I talked to her and there's something really strange. She doesn't remember saying that. And I said like, hey, but you told me. No, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. There you go. That's, yeah. So that's the, uh, the most dramatic first part of the dream, or first dream, I had two. The other one is a bit shorter. <laughs> it's not that long. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, it's so amazing for you to hear and for you to be in it as you're expressing, you know, what yes. you sort of felt and what you saw. And how do yeah. you, just before we go on the second dream, how do you see that dream? Like, what what did that provide you in your, I guess, grief or your understanding of where you are now? Well, actually... It is really, it's really nice that you asked this because I forgot to tell you something that I, I told you before when I talked to you the first time. After I talked to his wife on the phone, I went back to bed. It was like nine in the morning. So my wife said, are you all right? And I said, like, yeah, I'm going to lie here for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Just let me, you know, calm down. And then I realized something. It was all gone. I didn't feel ill. I didn't feel that the world was dark. I felt normal. I was back, back to normal. And okay, now I'm going to talk as a biologist. When you have something like this and you are in such a bad mental stage that has been going on for two or three days and you know that it's getting worse, you know that you will have to seek help, seek for help. At some stage, you will have to find somebody, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, whatever. There is no way that you can feel how I was feeling that morning without any treatment. It isn't possible. It's, it, it's absolutely impossible that I got totally healed in one night. And it was, this was the reason why I actually contacted you, because I know you went through something similar in your life. And I, I, I heard that in, in internet and in a YouTube channel. And I thought, okay, this is, I, I wasn't the only one. So basically what happened to me that I'm going to put it in very simple words. I'm totally depressed because my best friend passed away. He comes back. He hugs me and I'm, I'm healthy again. So that's what happened. And it happened in very simple terms. I was sick. <laughs> uh, eight hours later, I wake up. I'm sad, but I'm not ill. And, and that's impossible. And like from a biological point of view, when you have a depression, that's a biochemical unbalanced brain, you know. So what happened? How is that possible? How? No, that's not possible. Because of course, I'm even sad now, but I live my normal life. I do whatever, everything. I do everything. I, I play with my kids. I, I, I'm doing my job perfectly. Of course, I remember my friend every day, actually. I, I miss him very much. Sometimes I'm a little bit sad. I, I would say that. I can admit that. But I'm not sick. I'm not sick at all. So that's that's the most important thing 
for me from that first dream. Like I went through a healing process and it doesn't make any sense from a scientific point of view. And I can tell you that I, I, I can recall the dream and that's not a dream. That's something that I experienced. That's a memory. It isn't a dream. Wow. For me to listen to that and to go back to my own experiences, you're saying that it, that I was in, in a, a state of, you'd say, depression and have that dream to change you. And for you to share how much it changed you, it really gives people and listeners an idea of that there's something going on that we still don't understand that is providing yes. healing within the body and mind. And, and so what is that? How is that possible? I have no idea, but I do know what's common. Like you hear this across the globe. And yes. different people and not everyone gets it but some people do and it's just phenomenal and i don't know what it is but i know it exists and i think it's beautiful that it does exist because there's yes. something within us that is has the ability to heal and yes. who knows how or why but i always like to say it's the power of love because i think in those moments love is at its greatest um, yes. Because we don't have those constraints of the rational mind as when we are awake. But mm -hmm. when you're in a space of love, I think there's healing potential that's beyond our understanding. And I'm not sure that's just my own sort of theory, because that's what I sort of felt in my own dream when I hugged my father. And mm -hmm. I felt this immense amount of love. And I feel that was a part of what changed me uh, from the inside. But it wasn't, and I, I love too what you're saying. It's not even about the interpretation. You woke up changed. Like it, exactly. the dream itself changed you. It had nothing to do with your religious beliefs. It had nothing to do with anything. Mm -hmm. It was a dream itself changed you. And I think that can't be understated enough that the dreams have their own power. And it cannot be ignored. That's something that I, now I'm thinking, you know, a lot. Well, I think I told you before, as an ecologist, you see patterns everywhere. And when you see patterns, even though you don't understand the mechanisms, or what things drive these patterns. You cannot ignore the patterns. If these things happen to people everywhere in the world, why it, why people think it's not true? Why, why it should be a fantasy? If I'm telling you something physical happened to me, um, even the fact that I can remember a dream in, with all the details indicates that it's not a dream, not at all. Probably some other part of my brain was activated during that dream, so-called dream. But if something, some other part of my brain was activated, then it means that it wasn't a dream. So there wasn't a stimulation that provoked that, you know? So I don't know what it is, as you said. I don't know why it happened to me, not to his mother, to, not to his wife. I don't know. I understand now that our connection was strong, probably way stronger with, if you compare it to his mother, even, which is, it sounds unnatural, but but you can you can say I mean we understand we understood each other very well uh, and and a little bit of what made me so I don't know I'm restful I should say something <laughs> yeah is the fact that when he died it was like me dying at the same time because if you consider that we experience things in a very similar way in such a similar way that we understand each other so perfectly when he was experiencing these things I could project those things in me. And I said, like, oh, you know, like, what, what, what if, if that, this is like something happening to me as well, because when he's expressing what he's feeling, this is exactly what I would feel if I were in that situation. So, yeah. And, and there you go. So if now you ask me, are you an atheist? No. Are you a religious person? No. The only thing that I know is things do not end here. And that's the big change. And as a consequence, and this is something that probably my like your audience is going to find more, I don't know, beautiful, let us say, is that I understood that I got a gift. My friend gave me something after he passed. And he gave me hope. And I didn't have that before. I didn't have, sorry, I didn't have that before. I didn't have hope. I was scared of death. Even if I've, I wouldn't admit that openly, I was totally scared. The fact that uh, everything that I do here in this life ends up when I die was a really disturbing thought for me. And that happened to me. When I tried to explain that through religious beliefs, for me, were fantasies. And my friend gave me this hope. And, and 
And now I, I carry this hope with me. So my life is changing some perspectives. Problems are not that terrible if they don't manage your life. There's a lot of enjoyment in laughing and just having an ice cream in the park and not spending lots of money in a beautiful car that is just a piece of, you know, metal. Um, again, cliches, they come back, but now I understand them. Now I, I feel them. And that's very different. So it doesn't interfere with my biological way of thinking in the same way. I'm still a scientist, but I'm, I'm happier. I'm more relaxed. I want to live life and have lots of fun. I try to avoid conflicts and bad days. I don't want them. I want to be nice with people. I like people being nice to me. I appreciate them. And that's part of the gift that Mahi gave me. And that that's way something, like way over the top. I mean, I will never be able to give him something like that because he's not here anymore. But I am grateful. And if this thing is not real, Imagine that this is just my imagination playing tricks on me. I don't care because now I have hope. And that hope was inspired by my friend and still a present. This is still a gift from him. So that's beautiful. It is it's something different. That's why I wanted to share it with people. I wanted to talk to you in an open podcast, you know, because if hope can be given in such a way, such a nice way, we should all be happy to, to that the hope is there. I mean, I'm the mo- I was the most furious atheist in, in terms of what happens after you die. I was just, you know, you die, you decompose, your brain cells decompose, and memories are proteins, so forget about them. They're going to be part of another organism or just, you know. But it's not like that. It can, it can I mean, I didn't experience that. I experienced the contrary. There's something else, something else coming. I don't know. And that was confirmed by my second dream. Okay, I can't wait to hear it. So what's that? <laughs> the second dream happened exactly one month after the first one, but exactly at the same hour. Like one was on the the morning of the 8th of January, which is like the night of the 7th. You know, you one it probably was 1 a.m. between 1 and 9 a.m. of the 8th of January. And the other one was exactly the same in February. So just to contextualize this, in February, we every February we go to Argentina. We spend a month there vacationing with my wife's family. So that day, well, we, we got there. We had to catch a cab from Buenos Aires to Mar del Plata, which is like six hours, <laughs> six hours drive. I was squeezed in the, you know, the rare seat. And so I was quite relaxed, you know, Argentina is beautiful. So you go there and everything is nice. So I was sitting there and I was half asleep. And suddenly this thought came to my mind. And I was like, it was very straightforward. Uh, something like, I would like to know what my friend is doing now. What is he doing? Like, how is life over there? Like, thinking it in a very open, open-minded open way, you know, like, <laughs> open mind. Yeah. So I would be, <laughs> I was like, oh, what, is, what is he doing there? How would that be? How is a normal life on the other side? I didn't think too much about it. So we got to Mar del Plata, went to a hotel, and we went to bed. I fell asleep. And there he was, back again. Um, so I'm falling asleep, and suddenly I kind of wake up in the dream, which is for me, again, not a dream. And I saw my friend. So he's like, hey, how are you? And I'm like, hey, good to see you. Yeah, I, yeah, I was wondering how you were doing. But this thing was different because we were like in a, room, in a room with white walls and he was talking to me from the other side of the wall. So imagine that you have two rooms and the wall that separates these two rooms has a hole in the middle. So he would be talking to me through that wall, through that hole, sorry. Okay. So it was like a, I think, have you seen these puppets? That <laughs> kind of behind, the, you know. Um, so he would be talking to me from that side without coming close to me. He wasn't coming. And I was quite straightforward. I was like, hey, how are you? I would like to know what you're doing. Like straightforward, like this. But first, I, no, I, yeah. And I said, I would like to know how are you doing and what you do, you know, now. And he was like, really? Yeah, yeah. So, but first, why haven't you talked to Rodrigo? Rodrigo is another friend of ours. Okay. It's part of the group. Uh, and, and he, this, this friend was very close to him, to my friend. Because they lived together, so he was always visiting him in the, when he was sick. And my friend was like, oh, you know, I've been trying to contact him, but he doesn't want to hear me. He doesn't want to know anything about me. 
or about this, like you now being on the other side of it, which is quite sensitive, of course, because my this other friend of ours, he, he lost his dad, his mom, his sister in a period of five years. They were all had cancer. Uh, it was terrible for him. And he also lost a friend. So actually, even now, when I talk to him, he doesn't want to know too, too much about this. I said, like, oh, okay, okay, well, so, well, you know, and... And then I go like, so what do you do? And I say like, well, you know, actually, I do things here. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, you know that I, <laughs> I was assigned to greet people. To what? To greet people? What do you mean? I said no. Like basically, they. He says they, and they assigned me. I don't know who are they, or who you know, who are these people? Or somebody I don't know. Uh, so my mission is to say. To, to receive people that come here and to give them the books. And like, really, the books? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So somebody comes here, I say hello, and I gave him, gave that person the book. And I say, like, a book, but yeah. And he said, yeah, and I, I'm, I've been quite busy, actually. Uh, I'm always receiving people here. And I have to give them the levas, the levas. Sorry, I have to say this because it's a, it's a Latin word. It's L-E-V-I-S, leva, you know? And I say, what's that? No, no, I have to do the levas. And for example, today I have to do 35, 35 levas. So I greet people and I give them the books. And you know that sometimes they don't want to receive them, the books. Really? Yes, it happened to me the other day. There was a Chinese gentleman that came here and I gave him the book and he refused to, you know, to get it, to receive that from me. And he said that he shouldn't be here. Uh, he was quite angry and I had to convince him, hey, you have to receive this. And I'm, no, 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 I shouldn't be here. I should not be here. So I was like, what did you do then? No, no, I just talked to somebody else and they took charge of this this person. Okay. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I do. He was like, yeah. But, so I went. Okay. Now, some interesting things. Leva, as a word, I thought it had something to do with mechanical engineer because he's, he's a, he was a mechanical mechanical engineer. And, you know, that's some part of the, some car engines where you they have the lever, you know. Uh, that's in Spanish with a with a B, not a V, a B. Well, but the thing is that I had a look more deeply into this word, and then I discovered that uh, this is a word that comes from ancient Roman, Latin Roman, in Roman times. And it means recruitment. And when you go into this word, and actually I actually have some, some of the references there, uh, it means that a lever would be the process of recruiting people and recruiting against their will, you know? And, and that was normally used for the military service in Roman times. So you would, you would do a lever when you recruit a number of people so you put them to serve in the army uh, against their, their will or without asking them, you know? So now it, it made sense. So my friend is in charge of recruiting or probably receiving people that die, probably, yes. But there's something interesting. He gives them the books. And that's something new. Um, and with the passing of time, of course, in the last few months, I think I told you that one day, a few months after that dream, I was working and, and there was a, a YouTube podcast. And then some person started to, you know, tell his experience in the energy death experience. And suddenly I, I wasn't paying attention because it was just something that started playing in the background without me, you know, looking for it. And suddenly he goes like, yeah, you know, and I died and there was this person receiving me there and he wanted to give me the books of my life. And I, can, I have to look, I, I've got goosebumps now, now, right now, because I was working, I had to stop. And, and there, there were lots of things there. I, I'm telling you, this happened in, in April and the dream was in February. So there was, and to be honest, I haven't been reading things that could be, you know, like filtering into my subconscious. No, 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 I was nothing. And then he, he said a lot of things in this, in this, um, it's a kind of a podcast, of course. He said that the people there receive others. They, there are people assigned to receive the recently dead people passed, people that passed away. And they give them their books of their lives. And there's all the information about their lives. And there's something else that probably I didn't tell you in this because I, I, I went through this, this, um, this YouTube video again. And he talks about the rooms where people have cameras where they can see their lives. And now I have another point in common with what I saw in the barn. 
my friend pointed towards the camera in the bottom and he said, this is gone. This is the past. It's not my life. It's like, so again, you have all these patterns. Why are there so many things in common? You know, why? Um, I cannot ignore that. Well, after he said that in the dream now, uh, he goes and, and he says, now I have to ask for a couple of favors, two favors, Enrique. And I was like, yes, okay. <laughs> The first favor would be, can you go to my house and recover a video from a pen drive or a number of videos from a pen drive in my house? Because I don't want them to be around and everything. And I said, like, well, I'll try, you know. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for me to go and, you know, <laughs> break into his house just to steal videos from his pen drives and hard disks. Um, actually, I talked to his wife uh I told her, and he, she said, by the way, I saw her a few months ago. She said, oh, there are lots of pen drives and hard disks there, but I never look at them. If you want one day, you can come. But I don't know. I don't know if I'll do it. I, I feel a little bit strange about it. You know, I, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'll think about it. And the other thing that was important as well, he said, Enrique, and the other thing is, just don't tell too many people that you talk to me. And I said, why? Because they're going to think that you're crazy. And that's not fair. And I was really, yeah, yeah. So tell them, but not too many, which is exactly the contrary of what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm telling too many people what I saw. <laughs> okay. Although I, uh, um, yeah, I'm quite confident that people would not think that I'm crazy. <laughs> not at this stage, at least. So he said this. And, and then, okay, now the dream gets a little bit more like a dream, typical dream, because he said... Because look, and and that suddenly we we change into another room. I'm sitting in on a table. My friend is on my left, and on the other side, there are two friends from high school. So I turn around to the left. This is like a movie, you know. I turn around to the left and say, like, "Why do you bring me here?" And my other two friends look at me. What are you saying, Enrique? Whom are you talking to? There's nobody there. And my friend on the other side is like, you know. They think you're crazy. They can't see me. Okay. And I'm like, okay, so what do I do? And, and my friend says, okay, you know what? We're going to stop this. And he grabs a scarf. And again, the figure of a scarf. I don't know what a scarf means. He grabs a scarf and he throws the scarf into the faces of my other two friends here. They look at this scarf flying around. They look at me. They kind of panic and leave. And then I say like, well, What's going on? And he said, no, no, you know what? I have to go now, really. I'm really busy. So I'm going to leave you now. And yeah, so take care a lot. And I we just say goodbye without touching each other. Always keeping a distance, uh, which is interesting. And that was it. That was the, the end of the second dream. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love it. I love sort of some of the messages and the feelings that you're, you got from that. And some insights to maybe how it is, right? Like as a scientist, you kind of, you know, you're yeah. wanting to explore it more to understand like what is, what is going on when we die. So like, it was an interesting question, but it's interesting how you got a certain answer that probably yes. has allowed you to shift, you know, what you would respond to. And even they get that video from YouTube that's playing, they give you some context of the book. I thought it was interesting. I want to focus on at the point where he said not to tell too many people. I think that's really interesting in why I do what I do. I think there's truth to that in many ways, where because a lot of people don't understand the topic and there's not a lot of research on the topic, people have put their own biases and perspectives on it without understanding the truth to it. And I think that's the importance of research coming into where we are now today and the importance of thinking like the stuff that I'm trying to do is more and more research to normalize the experiences within bereavement. So just even in my research, most people after a death will uh, of their significant loved one it could be, you know, so like a person or even a pet will have a dream of that deceased. Some are going to be more riveting than others. Some will be negative. A lot are going to be a little bit more comforting. But at the end of the day, people are having these experiences. And so when I first started investigating this field, a lot of people didn't take me seriously. People didn't want to hear what I had to say or really were interested in the topic. But now that there's research, people are more open to understanding it and also publicly putting on presentations in their organizations yeah. on the topic. And so I think it's fascinating. On That's what I'm seeing on my angle. And so I, can, I don't understand the culture in Chile yet. And so understanding 
mine's more like Canada, North America. And so that's just trickling into those ears and eyes. And so, but I'm, this is a, a global phenomenon. It's a human experience mm. that people are having. And so there's probably a lot of truth to that because I don't know what kind of research is done in Chile on the topic. I'm guessing probably nothing. nothing. And then, yeah, <laughs> nothing. Yeah. And so for me, there's actually some truth to that because a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people state a lot of negative experiences that they had when they did share to mm, others. Yes. And it kind of, it can take away and make you take away from the meaning that you're, you've gained from it. A lot of people can even put a negative connotation on it. As you said, call you crazy. Um, some people say it's the devil. Like there's a lot of things that people can turn something beautiful into because of their yes. own misunderstanding and, and fear and, and judgment. So I think it's, it was to protect you from others, but it's also, I think it was protect you in the sense of the experience. So people didn't mm. shift that because that experience is what's so meaningful to you as you can sort of just share and gain your confidence to know your path. And I think now that you're ready to come on, I think it's fine because now you're confident what you believe in. But when you first has it happen, you're very moldable because you're, yes. you don't know what's going on. You had this experience and you almost want to trust other people to give you guidance. But there's such a, a thing where you had to find your own way. And I'm glad you reached out personally because we had this great talk and, <laughs> and we're able to sort of see in different stages because now you're talking about it a little differently than when you shared it in the first point because you didn't yes. know, right? Like you're just exploring it all. And now like you tell, I see the confidence. I see, I see that within you. And I, and I love that. And I love that you're able to share these experiences because how beautiful like this is so beautiful within your grief journey it's a it's a beautiful experience and if you think about chile in particular uh, just a, a personal point of view i would say that the problem here is there's a lot of separation uh, in terms of social and classes you know class class separation no race is class is the more predominant here so if if there were Okay, if we if I had the possibility, for example, to to do research on this topic, just imagining this, what would you you will find is that if you go to the low education people with lower education, they share these things like a normal part of their lives. As you start going up in in terms of social class, you know, upper class or middle upper class, and people are more educated, then people will see you as an uneducated person because you accept these fantasies from, you know, from the countryside or from the poor neighborhood. So normally that would be associated with ignorance, you know, like how can you experience that? That's an ignorant discourse, like typical from the countryside, people uneducated. Uneducated people would, would talk to their dead relatives. And that's interesting because I don't belong to that. I'm, I'm an academic. I'm a highly educated person for the Chilean standard and probably for the world standard, you know, you know that we are colleagues, we are PhDs. Uh, you, that means that you have invested a lot of your time in your life to to educate yourself. And again, I cannot ignore the patterns. This thing exists, you know, exists, and 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 I experienced it. And it doesn't make me less educated or ignorant or anything. Um, and I would say that as a scientist, probably the honest thing to do would be to agree on what I experienced and to embrace it. I cannot leave it there, put it aside and, and continue ignoring things that are happening, particularly when you have such a deep emotional effect on your life. Okay. So probably, yeah, it would be necessary to throw down some barriers, you know, to just open discussions. And, and the most important thing is as long as these things help people to go through the journeys, to cope with the you know, sadness, there is nothing wrong with that, you know? It's always a good thing to do, okay? Um, if you, if people want to share their experiences like what I'm doing now, and that has a good effect and l listen, if one person listens to this podcast and we help that person to go through the, it, her terror, his journey in a better way, that's, that's it. So the goal is completed. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what I why I decided to share this. Because again, I'm a I'm in a better state of mind now. I'm I'm I have hope, you know, I'm a better person, maybe, I don't know. And this is the result of a really traumatic experience, huh? because the death of your best friend is a traumatic experience, you know. And so so yeah, so probably just keep keep telling the world what's going on. Okay. Yeah, that, and I that would be really really appreciate you sharing too because we do need people to step up especially with these types of dreams that 
are so life changing. And yes. like people need to understand that this isn't like a fluke. It's not like this is going on all around us, but people just aren't talking about it because they're afraid to. And I think you see this just throughout time until research catches up with the experiences of humans. People don't believe it. Same thing happened with the sexual abuse, even nightmares. People thought if you had a nightmare, that means you're crazy. But now we know that's very common, but no one spoke about it. And the more we can speak about this and speak about what goes on when we are grieving, well, then we can help people who are grieving to normalize the experiences that they're having. Because I think grief is hard enough. And then like you have all these other experiences that we don't know and emotions, we can complicate our own lives with misinformation. And so let's just bring it back down to the grief and realize that what's going on is a natural process, part of it all. And this is where this comes in. And some of it say like, it can really be life changing for you. Like it was for me. And like, here I am doing research on it. It's just amazing where our paths can go. But I think providing meaning also from your loss is important. I think that's what you're doing today is by sharing is just providing meaning and you're allowing yourself to provide space for other people on their journey. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it's not as difficult as what you went through. And, and so I, I really appreciate you opening up your life to the world. Uh, it means, it means a lot you. to me and I'm really happy you're in that space that you can. Thank you. Thank you. Well, those are beautiful words again. Yes. If you can help others, why not? Why don't, <laughs> why don't do it? Why not? Sorry. <laughs> why not? Why, why you wouldn't do it is yeah. And yeah. And again, you know, uh, probably in the future, I will confront things in a different way or in a more, I don't know, solid way. I'll be, I'll be more ready to handle this kind of thing. Although I know it is difficult. Okay. Um, uh, death is an ex it's a difficult experience, particularly for us as humans, because we, we have, we're, we're conscious. We, we, we know that we are, we have a limited time. Okay. I don't know how it, it applies to the animal kingdom. I do know that some mammals do experience things like that, like, like, like that, sorry, like us. But still, you know, for humans, it's always difficult. It's the price of having a super developed brain. You know, you're more aware of what's, what's going on around you. But then you have all these other things. So is there another dimension there where people are, you know, are pass after dying here? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound so unrealistic now for me. Uh -huh. And again, I know that some of my friends that are atheists, <laughs> they're, well, they'll look at me like if I were, you know, like, hey, what's going on with you, right? But that um, doesn't matter. At this stage of my life, you know, I'm a good up man at this moment. Like, I'm pretty confident about myself, so I don't really care too much if people doubt or see me in a different way. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. But I, what I know is going to happen is that this thing is going to help, you know, others. Okay. So yeah. And that's important. That's something that I probably I owe it to my, my friend. He helped me. Probably I can give a hand to somebody else. If, if I don't know, you know, that person probably if it helps, it's good. That's it. Amazing. And then <laughs> as you wrap up on the podcast, the, the last question we'd like to ask our guests is if you could have a dream tonight yes. of someone who's deceased, uh, who would that be? And what would that look like? Well, the first I would like to, to see my friend again. <laughs> That's for sure. And I'll be extremely happy to just share a couple of hours of conversation to tell him all the crazy things that have happened to me during the last 11 months. Um, and I would like to know how he's doing. And I would ask him to fulfill his something that I asked him before he died. And that's a promise. And the promise was that he would come to pick me up once my turn comes, because I told him I don't feel comfortable, you know, in new situations, being in new situations without anybody that I know around. So one of the conversations that we have, we had, sorry, before he, he died was, okay, can you promise to come here and pick me up, you know, or be there waiting for me? So I want to ensure that. Uh, so I'll have a conversation with him. I would like to laugh with, with him again. I really miss those laughing sessions. They could last for hours, you know. <laughs> there were lots of lots of happiness involved in our friendship. So yes, yes, that's what I like to. I would like to do. I would like to to dream with him again, to be with him, and, and laugh and 
and make him fulfill his promise. <laughs> I, lo- I love that. It sounds like a great dream. And do you think he he's got promoted yet, or is he still uh, in the same job? I don't know. Actually, I told my wife, and my wife looked at me and and she said, "That's like your nightmare. They're gonna keep you. <laughs> you're gonna keep working after that." <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I like to be by myself. I just like to do what I want to do. But if I go to the other side, imagine. And somebody's going to assign me duties. No, 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 no. Forget about it. I've done enough here in this life. I've, <laughs> I've gone. I just have no idea how many students, projects, family, papers, articles, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I will need a break. <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. And I appreciate, so just said, like just you being so open and honest. And I look forward to hearing about any new dreams you have in the future. Yeah, of course, of course, we we will be in touch. Um, yeah, I wouldn't like to lose actually the, the contact. Uh, we 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 can kind of have some chemistry, you know, to talk for hours and hours. <laughs> so I hope if I go to Canada one day, I'll I'll probably give you a call. Or if you come down to Chile, you know, you're invited to come at any moment whenever you want. Just give me a call. I'll I'll take you here. I'll receive you here. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, my friend. Take care a lot. <laughs>